well, good evening to everyone. Uh, well, as uh, you might know, my name is Sebastian Cerezo, and I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the University of Chicago and Chicago Booth Alumni Club in Spain to our discussion on Europe's recovery plan with Luis Garicano. We have a pretty decent turnout today, so that's good. It is truly an honor to introduce you to our distinguished speaker today, Luis Garicano, and not the least because I had the pleasure to have him as a professor during my MBA. By the way, Luis, I enjoy your classes very much. Uh, you know that. <laughs> uh, going through Luis's resume would take us forever, so I am particularly grateful to uh, Luis's team, which have provided us with a short summary. Among many other accomplishments and positions, Luis Garicano is a member of the uh, European Parliament and leader of Ciudadanos in Europe, as well as by president of Renew Europe for Economic Affairs. Before entering the world of politics, he was a professor of economics and strategy at the Instituto de Empresa and the London School of Economics. Previously, he was a professor at the University of Chicago from where he also received his doctorate. His academic work focuses on the future of work, the relationship between technology and inequality and economic growth. A quick note on logistics, Luis will do a 15 to 20 minute presentation. And after that, we will have a Q&A session moderated by my colleague Fiona. You can submit your questions to the chat box, raise your hands, and we will try to take as many as we can. So that's all from my side. Thanks very much for your time, Luis. The virtual stage, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I tried to thank you before for, for your kind <laughs> words, but uh, they, had, they had not, uh, uh, the settings were, were not allowing me to do it. So it's really, really a pleasure. I'm delighted to have uh, 100 people, 99, we're just about to reach 100 people online. Sometimes Zoom, you know, we all complain, we all love to complain about how terrible Zoom is, but Zoom allows us to do many things. Some of you are preparing dinner for your kids, some of you are, are, are just running around or doing whatever it is that you're doing, and, 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 and you can be uh, listening uh, to this podcast from, from all over the world. I, I had, I had a, a presentation on the carbon border adjustment mechanism today in Bruegel and the three discussions that I had, one was in Brussels, the other one was in Essex and the other one was in Delhi. So sometimes, sometimes it's quite, quite nice things about Zoom. So it's really wonderful to be here. Good to see Sebastian again and Fiona and all these, all these known and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, loved uh, faces. And um, I wanted, to, I wanted to tell you about the, the Spanish um, recovery plan. I think that's, that's the most timely topic. Maybe in the Q&A, you want to, to talk about something else. But this is something that I've been very involved from the start. I have, uh, uh, you know, if you're an economist, some of you have, have experience of this kind. When you have a technical background or a more technical background than other people, if, you know, in normal times, Maybe your skills are not as required, but if there's a crisis coming your way, you know, the virologists are now the kings of the world, right? We all want to hear the virologists. And, and economics is a bit the same. You're in the parliament, you're doing your, your, uh, your banking union things, a bit obscure. Uh, Rosa knows what I'm talking about. She's, Rosa Lastra is there. She's sometimes been an expert in parliament. She's a professor at Queen's Mary in London. And, and you, you're in your niche. And suddenly something like this happened and, and people were looking around, okay, what does Europe do? And I was lucky to be there in Parliament and to be kind of able to, 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 to help change the paradigm. We did a resolution, a very, very strong uh, resolution asking for joint debt by Europe uh, in, in, in April. Uh, that was really, you know, my group has something very nice. So it's like kind of as a question of background before starting, which is that we have in the group Macron and Rutte. We have the Dutch Liberal Party, the VVD, and we, oh, which is in government, and we have a march, which is the party government in France. So in some sense, if you manage to get a consensus inside your group, you can know that you have a consensus in Europe uh, to some extent. So, so we managed to get a resolution first approved by Renew and then by the parliament without any comma change. What we passed in Renew was what parliament passed, asking for three things that have been crucial. Common debt, backed by the European Union, that is given in the form not of loans, but of direct investments in the member states, so real solidarity, not just moving money around and giving loans. So Europe borrows, gives it to the member states, and the interest is paid, we said from the start, and the principle from joint resources by Europe, by resources that are not 
direct contributions of the of the countries, but resources that are um, uh, new kind of taxes or levies that Europe raises. So we passed that. Then it passed in Parliament. A bit later, Spain presented this plan. France and France and Germany presented a plan that were basically picking up different elements of what we were pushing or helping push. And in July, we had this big moment when the leaders actually spent four days in a room and came up with this recovery and resilience facility. So that was that was a huge, huge moment uh, for Europe. It's the first time there is really kind of a form of fiscal solidarity. We all borrow together and uh, do things together. We spent a few months uh, do, do things with that money together, invest that money together, sorry, and for the imprecision. Um, we spent the next few months negotiating the details and everything. We have a regulation that uh, it's a law it's not called law because the member states didn't want, the same way as the member states of Europe don't want the European Commission to be called the European government, the member states didn't want the European laws to be called laws, they're called regulations. That's fine. There's a regulation that decides how this money is spent, that is a consensus between Parliament and the member states that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, and that was uh, approved after nights on all nighters of negotiations in December, and that we're going to vote next Tuesday in Parliament. So it will be law in, in Tuesday and becomes the way that this 750 billion euro is going to be divided. So that's the uh, background of what I want to tell you. Um, and I want to start from here. Um, so the European Recovery Fund is the um, uh, big, big novelty from an economic perspective of the European Union right now. It is, a, let's call it, let's say Europe has a regular budget, which is the MFF, the multi-annual financial framework. Um, and that's around, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 1,000 billion, okay, a trillion. Um, I thought it was a typo with billions, but it's correct. Um, and there is an extraordinary budget that is borrowed with the backing of the regular budget, which is 750 billion, that includes is this next generation program that includes a 670 uh, billion recovery and resilience facility. Then there's another program, much smaller, which is React EU, which is emergency funding for pandemic related efforts. And then there is an, some top ups for the European budget. Some of this money, by the way, will be used for the vaccine race that has started and then Europe has. You probably will want to ask me um, uh, also a little bit about that later. Um, so, how much will Spain get? Uh, some of what I'll say will be general. I know some people are watching from other places, quite a few people watching from Spain. So some of it will be Spain, Spain focused. Spain will receive the second most uh, grants. Uh, we're expected to receive 19.9%, uh, sorry, 20.6% uh, of the grants and also 19.9% of the loans. So React EU is grants uh, and then this RFF is grants. As you will see, and that will be a big theme of this talk, Spain receives an overwhelming majority of the money in the, or has to assign the overwhelming majority of the money very fast in the first two years, and that will be, and that will be a problem. So that's Spain, and this is Italy. As you will see, Spain receives, uh, Spain receives 47 and 12 um, direct uh, investments, and then there is, there is some loans. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I said it wrong. That's the RRF 2122. I'm, I'm, this is a new graph. Apologies. RRF 2122, 47, RRF 23, 23, and React EU 30. Uh, so, what's React EU? React EU is a program that allows us to react very, very quickly uh, to the pandemic. It basically gives 25% of the funds that are in React EU to Spain. So, it's 47.5 billion facility, of which 12.4 billion are for Spain. Um, they are going to be cohesion, mostly health systems, small and medium enterprises, uh, the ERTES that everybody in Spain knows, the courts abide for those who are abroad in Europe. Um, very flexible, 100% co-financing. Countries can, can distribute the money the way more or less they, they want, and, and they don't need to put money themselves. It's all money from Europe, and they can distribute across regions. In Spain, uh, the money is going to be spent within regions, between regions, according to the impact on the wealth on the, and the GDP, the impact on unemployment, and the impact on youth unemployment. The recovery facility, as I told you at the start, this is the biggest part of the money, 672 billion 
and um, there is a, um, a, a, a set of rules in this regulation I'm telling you about that I'm going to describe quite quickly. So there's, this is to be spent in six areas, green transition, digitalization, competitiveness, social expenditure, institutional, and youth. Um, you cannot spend it to finance current recurrent spending. It has to be to, for these extraordinary things. It's been this transformation money, it's been designed this transformation money that will make, that will make Spain different, that will make the countries receiving it be able to transform their economy. There's conditions. Uh, if you follow the debate in Spain, that's the big thing that people are talking about. What are the conditions? The conditions are that the plan should address um, the reform recommendations that Europe has done. You have to have an A. You can get A, B, and C. You have to have an A in these five areas. It has to be addressing the reform recommendations of Europe. Before there were recommendations, now there is money going with that. Should contribute to increasing job uh, economic growth. Should help green digitalization and do no harm to the environment. So you can't finance projects that harm the environment with this money. Um, reforms are key. Uh, you need to describe what reforms you're going to do and how will you address the European semester. What's the European semester? The European semester is a bit of jargon. It's an exam that the European Union gives to its countries and tells them what are the things on which its economic is, economy is badly performing. Uh, not just budgetary, but many, many areas. They're evaluating and then there are recommendations. The recommendations of Spain are in four areas, fiscal, uh, green, um, oh, this, this slide was half translated and half not, uh, apologies. I just say, especially for Chicago, I've never given this presentation in Spanish and that's why a couple of the slides um, can be, can be uh, uh, still um, not, not fully done. It's the job of today. Uh, fiscal spending, uh, transition in energy and um, single market in Spain and, and social services. So fiscal spending is where all the pension reforms and the fiscal, <laughs> the best fiscal sustainability, the fiscal rules are suspended. So basically it's about pensions, green and digital. It's about R and D, energy, rail, etc. The market unity is about uh, making sure that there are no barriers between regions, as you know, with the autonomous regions in Spain, we've developed a lot of regional rules. This is not being put a lot of effort, uh, of emphasis in Spanish public debate, but it's something that is very, very important. And then social services and employment, which includes um, labor market, indefinite contracts, incentives for hiring, uh, employment assistance, education, professional training, extremely thing, important things that Spain is late on. The commission, has added seven points for all countries. These are seven ideas from the Commission that they want to see. Um, power up is about renewable energy. They want us. They want to see 200 gigawatts from all countries in renewable energy. Renovate. They want to see building the building uh, doubling the renovation rate of buildings. Recharge. They want to see one million electric charging vehicles by 25. Connect. 5G available across all Europe, rural as well. Modernize. A European ID and public administrations all integrated. Scale up, which is about um, having countries, companies using big cloud and, and big data. And reskilling, which is about uh, professional training uh, actually leading to jobs. So these are some programs that the Commission, uh, these seven programs the Commission has said they want to see in every plan with actual quantitative objectives. Now, something very important is that the money will be disbursed according to milestones and objectives. So these targets, these milestones and targets are actually what will make these ideas that I've told you here and here actually stick. Because they won't give you the money unless you put the milestones and targets. So the governments are now negotiating this question. The governments are now exactly in this point where they want to say like, well, you give us the money and we do what we want. And the commission says, no, no, no. We want to see that by 21, you already have two out of five professional trainings having a job, and they will give you extra money. So that there is really an actual uh, incentive for countries to perform. For example, in reskilling, you want to see digital curriculum, uh, support investment in this digital infrastructure, things like that. How are we going to control that this happens? Um, the European 
Parliament demanded and achieved that there is supervision by the anti-fraud audit offer in the Court of Auditors, and that this database with the name of all final recipients. So there is nobody who actually gets the money that escapes from control. Then there is going to be the Commission will review the plans, the Council will approve them, they will be implemented with these targets uh, and milestones. There is the Council can stop everything if one member state says that the Commission shouldn't be distributing the mock funds, then the European Council is going to look and discuss. And Parliament has the right to receive all documentation and the Commission has to listen to our uh, complaints or, or, or resolutions. What is the calendar? Basically, this is important for some of you who are actually involved with these issues. Um, the Member States will submit the draft plan. Uh, they have already done it. They submit the final plan by April. Then it's evaluated by June. Then within four weeks more by July, it's approved. And then you get 13% of the money up front. And then when you start meeting milestones and targets, starting from December 21 and until August 26, you get the money every six months with your milestones. Then you fulfill objectives. Uh, the Commission decides and the European Financial Council, which is kind of part of the Council of Governments, the, the Council of Ministers, and a set of experts make sure that those milestones are fulfilled and you get the payments. Um, the state aid rules actually applied. So some of what you hear in Spain about the government giving the money, there is too much optimism on how they're going to be able to give it. Uh, it actually has to be according to state aid rules. Um, so basically there's going to be a state aid process. I'll show you very quickly if, 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 the, if they provide some, uh, some plan, uh, if it's no state aid, then there's no need to notify. It is yes. If, if it's an approved scheme, it, it doesn't need to be codified, codified, codified by um, approved. But if it's not compliant with the block exemptions, which is one rule that allows many things to, to exempt from state aid, then you actually need notification and need approval for that money to be spent. Now, one issue to finalize on how Spain is ready to do this, basically um, the, the uh, plan basically provides for most of the money, as I was telling you in my first slide, to be spent in 21 and 22. The transfers, 24 billion this year, 24 billion next year, have to be allocated over these two years and 23. Imagine how fast this is for a public administration. Any of you who knows about administrative law and contracts knows how slow this is. The disbursements are more spread out, but even that finishes in 26, essentially. But imagine how complicated it's going to be for a country like Spain to absorb so much money so quickly. Um, to give you an example, in the previous uh, multi-annual financial framework, Spain was allocated 56 billion, and we were the worst students in the class. You can see the Spanish flag here, um, lowest on percent spent and lowest on both percent spent and percent um, decided. So not just executed, but also decided. Um, Spain is, is, has been traditionally in terms of bureaucracy and also the interaction between the regional and the national level that the regional is jealous of the national, so it doesn't want to do what the national wants. The national says the regional doesn't have the competence. So we end up in these conflicts of competence that actually slow down massively. The, the recovery, um, the, the allocation. Um, Spain presented in October a draft. We haven't seen yet the plan, although they're finishing up the negotiations with Brussels, it appears. Um, they want to spend around 82 billion in, in uh, ecological, digital, gender cohesion. Um, there is in particular 37% uh, for green and 33% for digitalization. Um, there is a key tool to disburse the money, which is called a PERTE, Strategic Project for Economic Recovery and Transformation, Proyectos Estratégicos de Recuperación y Transformación Económica. They are, they have great spillovers uh, and they are projects that basically think about the interconnection between Spain and France in electricity, or think about these uh, electricity charging stations for um, electric, uh, these for, for electric vehicles, for EVs. Um, the Council of Ministers decides that the project is a PERTE and then it's able to get particular subsidies and, and etc. My fear in Spain is the governance is weak. Uh, there's no transparent channels for development of, of plans. There hasn't been a public tender or a public call for ideas. Um, really, the only ones who have managed to get their ideas heard are, are the, the chronic capitalists and their friends, the ones who actually know 
people in Moncloa. And there is a lot of frustration in the private sector. I'm sure I, I will hear it from some of you, uh, particularly from PMES, um, that, that people are quite frustrated with that. The regions are also upset. They don't feel they have been consulted. Um, they have, there has been really no coordination in the sectoral conferences. There was a meeting where it was blocked because the Spanish government came with the idea that in the sectoral conference, it should have 19 votes. The communities are 19, so they get 17 plus two cities and the government should have an extra vote for uh, disempathy, for breaking ties. So people felt it was pretty unfair. Um, little information for the, for the presidents. I met with many regional presidents and, co and consejeros and, and ministers, and nobody had a clue of what was going on. It's very much managed from the bunker, uh, from the bunker in Moncloa, and we think if you're in a bunker, uh, you're not going to get really the execution that you want to have. The main reforms the Brussels is asking us, you know from the list that I gave you, the two more controversies are labor market and pensions. The government uh, basically is trying to get a free pass here. What is the government is telling Brussels? Well, we need to talk to the social partners, just give us the money and we'll have a reform. Well, we know what the reform will be. Um, we believe, I believe that we should be thinking about employment for digital and age. Education is our big, big uh, black spot, uh, green economy, it can make change in the healthcare systems and having a digital effective and public administration. As I was telling you, I feel the plan in Spain. That's my judgment. Um, you can disagree. Uh, my judgment is that there is really not a serious plan. It has, there has been no transparency. There is no expert board which is doing this, like, unlike in Germany or in Greece. It's very politicized and there is no real um, connection with the with the demands the process is making. I think there is a little bit more uh, serious uh, work in places like Germany. There is an external like, evaluation by the independent fiscal agency. The lender are being involved in Greece. And uh, Mitsotakis named the commission that is actually involved now in the plan. In Portugal, I think there is, there is a much more clear uh, technical board. And that is all I want to say. You have me in all those places for those who have LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or Twitter. Um, and it was, I hope, um, useful. Um, I remain as Sebastian asked me and Fiona for most of the time for the q and If you ask me for 20 minutes, there is your 20 minutes. Thank you. Please, thank you so much. That's, that's perfect. Um, we, we've already received quite a few questions actually before the event, and um, but if you want to ask something now, you, and I see some people already put some questions in the chat, you can also go to participants and raise your hand if you'd, if you'd rather do it live. But maybe we can just start off with a couple of questions from that we already received and then we, we can move on to the chat or the live. Um, one of the questions, a lot of the questions we got before this started were, were around the deployment of EU funds, Luis. How closely will Brussels monitor the funds to avoid state aid and what conditions will it enforce in order to, to get the funds? Is the EU going to require member countries to go back to budget stability? How will Europe ensure that member states apply recovery funds to the most hard hit industries? And then in, in the case of Spain, um, there is a perception that, that Spain is going to focus the innovation grants on the big companies, but Spain's biggest companies don't have a good innovation track record. How is that going to be resolved? Um, you asked me all the questions of the workshop in the first batch. Yeah, okay. sorry. I will stop it. there. But what are you your thoughts? On you can do one by one, I think. SMEs, uh, state aid rules, reforms. What was the fourth? And what is... You know, what is um, uh, innovation on the big companies. Um, big companies, yeah. big versus small. No, there's one more. There was state aid, reforms, and, SMEs versus big, and innovation. And innovation, that's right. So I ask, I'll ask one by one those four questions. State aid rules. Um, I pass it a little bit fast. Uh, I don't know if people are, are, are curious sufficiently to go over this. It's a tiny bit technical. But we can we can basically we can basically uh, see it. Basically, um, the Commission has not has said it won't waive them. Okay, so state aid rules remain in place. Um, the plans have to be submitted. Then they have to be assessed and they have to be implemented. At the same time, um, the state aid process uh, has to be started. If the reforms are not compliant with the with the block exemption, 
that already exists, okay, this is the same that already exists, if there is no, um, if they are not part of an approved scheme on, or, or they are not state aids, then nothing happens, but if, 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 if there is a yes here, then you need to notify, and then you're going to have the, the process. M Margaret St Vestager, the commissioner, has promised that she's going to do this really, really quickly. Um, uh, in principle, uh, she has she has an accelerating process, but state aid rules are going to be still existing. So that about the first one, uh, the the idea is that it won't take as long. Um, second, how will Europe uh, make sure that reforms will be taken? I also kind of discussed that uh, in, in, in four stages, uh, uh, just to remind you, or maybe to just use it as, as I answer and have you and have you uh, uh, on board. Um, the plan first, Brussels is going to ask for those reforms in the evaluation. I've asked everybody on the relevant DGs, from commissions to the top DG people. They have promised me they are being very serious about its demanding reforms. Then the council has to approve it. The council will not do as much, right? Because it's today for me, tomorrow for you, we say in Spain, or for ti mañana for me. I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, you scratch mine is the expression in English. Um, then the commission, third thing and, and second key thing, uh, once the plan is approved, you only get the money when you meet the targets uh, uh, approved. So if the commission says, okay, fine about your ideas for labor reform, you will get the second payment when you do the labor reform, then the commission has it very easy. It's like, okay, you get the money when you do the, the reform, you haven't done it, so there's no money to give you. Um, there is also the possibility that one member state stops things on its tracks. And there is also the parliament who will be ensured that there is the same uh, measuring stick for everybody. And that really what we're talking about when we're talking about reforms we really do need. Third, uh, SMEs versus big. Yes, the worry of the person who asked was uh, uh, really on, on a good track. Um, there is a, a uh, fear, which I think in Spain's case is particularly relevant. The government wants to spend the money fast. And when the government wants to spend the money fast, there is not many companies that you can write a check and that you know they're going to spend hundreds of millions of euros in Spain. There's Telefonica, there's Indra, there is uh, Iberdrola. You can put the name, Seat, the, the car companies, and everybody guesses that a lot of the plans will be routed through those companies and hopefully they will get to the SMEs. I don't think that's a, that's a good hope to, to have. I think there should be an explicit SME effort. I think SMEs have increasingly solvency problems. I, drew, I wrote in a confidential series of articles, Saturday and Sunday, two articles on, on the solvency problems of SMEs uh, and how to change uh, the way they're being treated. So yes, good concern. Innovation, that's a huge concern in Spain, right? Because there is no plans to do anything with universities. There's very little plan to, to really have startups being funded. The way it's gonna go is going, is going to go through the old IBEX. And how much of that is innovation? Well, I led you to think about it. I am not persuaded that will be a lot. Um, somebody's asking on these fiscal rules. Ah, no, well, let, let me just ask, let you, Fiona, uh, get, deal with that. No, that's fine. I see that we don't have any hands raised. Um, so, so if you want to go ahead, I mean, there, there, are, there are a couple of questions too around bailouts. Is this, is this a hidden bailout? It was one of the questions we had. Or, or um, do you think that the Spanish situation could end up with a situation or bailout similar to Greece in some years? Um, I was muted again by the host and not allowed to unmute. I would appreciate if I'm not muted more times. Um, sorry, sorry. That's why I was I was struggling with my finger. Thank you. Um, so uh, I will take the questions myself. Then. Um, so so once a, one person, I was struggling. So I don't know if you need to tell me something. I was struggling to unmute myself, and I was. Uh, I was no, I was, no. Go ahead. You you seem to be an old hand at doing this. Fiscal rules, uh, if somebody wants to raise hands, uh, please put your hand up uh, with raise hand up in Zoom and I will give you the word. Many of you, uh, not just Sebastian, but I know many of you are my students on the uh, London uh, program and on the Singapore and Hong Kong program. So uh, many of you know me and you should feel free to say hello as well. So 
doesn't have to be the deepest question. You know, we are among friends. Um, I'll go to you in a sec. So um, I promised to answer these fiscal rules. Uh, what is going to happen to them? This is huge for Spain, right? The fiscal rules have these this, um, uh, two parameters that you have to have 60% debt and 3% deficit. You can imagine that Spain is going to finish the whole thing with 130, 140% of debt to GDP, and ratio debt to GDP, and, and, and definitely uh, much more than 3%. I think we're going to have two or three years of double digit deficit. So very massive deficits. And that means uh, if they put the, the, the rules back, we're going to be in big trouble uh, very fast. The sense that we have is that it's going to take a while, maybe one, maybe two years. Doesn't mean we'll be without supervision. There will be adult supervision. They'll say, okay, the rules are not back, but you need to do your homework. Um, but it won't be as strict as when the SGP was there, the, the stability and growth pact, which requires you to be um, striving for this three and 16. Fiona, if you want to, to start taking those, those people for raising hands, it makes it more dynamic. Uh, Glada Fernandez, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi. Um, so we have actually, hi, <laughs> we have actually <laughs> submitted a project it, to, to Miteco, and I agree completely with what you talked about transparency. We have talked with so many different people from like the national party, from like the local parties. They have no idea how the fundings are going to be submitted, only that they really need to distribute the, the money really fast. The, we don't really know. Sorry for the baby. <laughs> the baby is very welcome. I, we like prospective students. So there is really, uh, from, from an SME perspective, we really like, we have no information of how it's going to be valued. Actually, the, the, the own, uh, the, Miteco created like a manifesto of interest. So you have to like write your, pre-write your project, but the rules were not very clear of what they're gonna value. And we're just like lost in translation. We don't really know what's going to be the evaluation process or if we even have like a chance, we're just like <laughs> doing an- so, uh, I didn't understand rules. the first phrase. So who, who was we in this context? Who did you oh. say you were? Working with on this. So uh, my company, my company, we submitted a project for Miteco. We're also located in a rural area, so it's like a, it covers like digital translation. Uh, it covers like a uh, repoblacion. It covers like female. Uh, 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 you hit every. You hit every. every, every. We had all the, all the milestones, and actually we sent it to like I don't know like twenty different people, you yourself included. <laughs> <laughs> I look it up. I look it up. Yeah, 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 in your email. <laughs> and <laughs> everyone told us it's, it's the, the best project they received from the Valencian community. Uh, we have, a, we've circulated to the toppest levels we actually can physically can, and we're completely lost of what is going to be like the process. But the people we talk to uh, can do, even don't have an idea. Like the, the people in, in Valencian community that are responsible for judging the projects tell us today, in 4th of February, they have no idea at all. So it's, my, 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 I'm, I'm so sorry to not be able to throw some light for you, Clara, but this is what I've heard from people, from, from CEOs of companies which are not politically connected to presidents of, of communities, to majors. I've met, I think, five or six um, presidents of, of regions and many, many councillors. And this is unanimous. Nobody, there is no webpage, there is no email, there is no phone number. There is no set of rules. There is no uh, uh, plantillas. How would you say plantillas? I'm now missing the words. There is no uh, forms that you can use. Uh, the commission has forms, but the government hasn't given any forms to anybody to fill in. So um, this is my biggest fear that many people, many innovators, many companies with rural like you with, with great projects will not even be able to get into the game because they haven't been in Moncloa with their friends who they know from the team of whomever, you know? And that is very depressing, very wrong. I said this in June in Parliament, in July, I've been kind of banging on this thinking like, it cannot be, right? It's like the pandemic when you're, you know, I was starting to tweet in February, like, oh, this is coming. I hope people are noticing and everything. And you're thinking, yeah, it cannot be that they are ignoring it, right? And you hear, oh, no masks. And you're like, what? And, and, and eventually you realize, yeah, this is actually happening. They're actually not going to play this ball. They're going to say, oh, that's not my problem. And this is, I think, 
uh, what is ha what is happening with this particular thing. I'm, I'm sorry, Clara, to not be yeah. able to give you more clarity, and I'm I'm glad to have your your point. Send me an email today again, and I mean okay. honestly, my email is so full. Uh, I'll take a look at the plan. Thank you. Could we take another one, uh, Ignacio Garcia? Would you like to ask your question? If you want to unmute? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Luis, for uh, spending your time. You're a busy guy. I'm a Stern yeah, MBA, but I'm also a Stern MBA in NYU, and I'm also down to earth guy. Uh, and and I think Clara's point is what the whole of the you know down to earth people in Spain are thinking about. You know the reality is that it's going to be extremely difficult to access funds. My question to you is. How come there is no condition to? Ignacio, I don't to, see you. I, 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 I don't think you have the video on. I think. Yeah, I'm happy yeah, to see are. me, but I'm on, but I'm on the trainer. That's okay. I'll share it with everybody. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, <laughs> Good. That's okay. So, yeah. I, so you're you're very much. In the, does, this is what the whole point of Zoom is. So you're welcome. Right. <laughs> so tell no, me, Ignacio. So, so the, the question is. How come there is no condition to allocate and use the funds, such as, you know, the people managing that money when it comes down to, to, the, to the real world, to the companies or to the government? How come a condition like, um, you know, somebody qualified that has an experience in managing money or managing a company, you know, some real down to earth experience, at the end of the day, the money is going to be managed by people that don't have a clue. <laughs> the the so, answer, Ignacio, is that you would imagine, you would imagine that uh, you would have to be a very foolish government Mama? to give the ability to, to spend 70 billion euros to somebody who's never run even a 1 million euro operation, as you said, Ignacio. And, you know, ignorance is very daring. People who don't know what they're doing always think, you know, uh, you know the curve, the curve of knowledge, right? When you don't know anything, is when you think you know a lot. As you learn, you every time think you know less, and then you start to improve, right? And 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 these people who are so ignorant think that, oh well, managing 70 billion, I can do that. And the truth of the matter is, like Nathan is saying, that doesn't work like that. I mean, the truth of the matter is, the people who are running the effort in Mukloa, well intentioned. I mean, I actually have a very high appreciation for some of them in terms of like being. Uh, pretty reasonable people are actually not people who have the ability to 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 evaluate projects, to allocate funds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we did the best we could put the conditions that you have seen, but the governments were pretty tough on actually allowing for anybody to stick their 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 uh, to try to get uh, control over who is spending the money and how they're spending it. But but Ignacio is very right. This is a Huge, huge. Yeah. I mean, th this is very serious stuff. We've never seen such a huge amount of money. No, nobody has seen. And the so. mistakes, the mistakes that could take place, uh, are uh, equally huge. The way the way I see it, Ignacio, is that I mean, you know, the Eres and the Ertes, no, the Eres and the Edu, the education scandals in in Andalusia were billion, multi-billion dollar scandals. Uh, there were scandals in Spain. If this money, if this happens with European money, you're going to see in the core of Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, the equivalent of the Barthenas scandal in Germany and in Holland. You imagine the damage that makes to Europe and imagine the yeah. damage that makes to Spain if people are, if it's common discussion in the cover of the German newspapers, so-and-so gave their money to their friends, so-and-so, and they spend their money in this way. I mean, that is devastating. I don't think the European project nor Spain can afford that kind. Should, should anyway, we thank you, Luis. Thank to, you, Luis. Thanks. Should we move on? There's a couple of questions on the chat that are the same question, which is is not related to fiscal rules, but but certainly to recovery. Why is Spain and the EU in general so far behind in vaccinating when compared to the UK and even the US? Uh, if the plan, okay, so so. Uh, Um, so, so uh, yes, I mean the vaccines is a is a really is a really huge huge issue, um, uh, unrelated to this. So I was I was more hoping to to do it at the end, but um, basically I think there are 
two explanations, three. The first explanation is uh, the anti-vaccine uh, people. It's kind of hard to say it in public. For me, the anti-vaccine people are the lowest specter of living forms in Earth. It really upsets me a huge amount that there are people who, who are so anti-science that they're willing to put their, their fellow humans in danger. But the people who are anti-vaccines um, are very powerful in some countries. And that means that there is a tendency to um, uh, appease them. So the European process has been at every stage super ponderous and super careful. Let's do the EMA. Let's take our time. Let's make sure we cover the bases. The Americans and the Brits have been a bit like, okay, let's just move this fast. We know since eight, March we have a vaccine. We know since July it's working. We know it's safe. Let's move, right? Um, that's the first, uh, a decision by European authorities to be overly cautious. And that was because of this uh, anti-vaccine population, this anti-science population, which are very powerful in places like France and Italy. Second, um, I think we had the wrong priorities. I think that the European Commission team had the mandate to go and get a good price, negotiate hard with the pharma companies. I think that this was a problem in the sense that um, there is no free lunch. I mean, you are Chicago, many of you, and you have heard this. Um, if you want to pay less, that's possible, but you will get less. And if you want to pay less, and um, that's going to cost, somebody's going to jump on the top of the queue because they pay more. And you get best efforts, you know, in politics, uh, one MEP friend of mine was saying yesterday, in politics, when somebody, you ask for something and somebody says, I'll do my best effort, that means no. So these contracts with the vaccine manufacturers say they'll do our, their best efforts. <laughs> you get a painter, you call a painter to your house and you say, can you come next week? And they say, well, we'll do our best efforts. What does it mean? Will they come next week or will they not? Uh, it's not a very reassuring language. Uh, so price. And third, I do think there was a bit of a bureaucratic incompetence part. I mean, the European Commission is like the Ministry of Sanidad in Spain, the health ministry taking care of the purchases of, 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 of masks in April last year. There were ministry that doesn't have competence. They haven't been doing anything ever. How are they going to buy masks? They, 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 the, the, the sanitary, comp the health competence in Spain are in the regions, but this is the same. There are no health competences in Europe. So the health commissioner was something that, well, okay, they don't have to do a lot. They put a DG who was very smart, but there was not a bureaucracy ready for this. So I think that, you know, a state, France or Germany buy nuclear shelters, nuclear plants, they buy uh, aircraft carriers, they buy submarines, nuclear submarines in the case of, Germany, of France, they make big, big ticket purchases. I don't think the commission was really, really ready at that point. So those are my three explanations. Great, thank you. Uh, Paolo Guida, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes, I'm sorry not uh, to show my face, but I'm driving, so I think uh, it's, it's safer not to do that. All right. Well, uh, well you see me anyway. Um, no, Luis, thanks. I think it's really fantastic. I mean, to see first, uh, first time a little bit of numbers uh, backing uh, like... Uh, evidence and claims and comparing like different countries across Europe. So I think uh, first thing I wanted to ask you is uh, how do you see Italy if you basically see the story of Spain uh, maybe on a large bigger magnitude. And second is uh, regarding this uh, uh, I mean uh, rush to spend money which people were not expecting. So I think you have two two options. One is uh, you use it to pay down debt uh, which is like the easier uh, is not going to boost uh, GDP growth, but at least uh, uh, is, um, is, is uh, how can I say, alleviating a little bit like the burden on, on future generations. The second is instead, if you think this is like the beginning of a permanent transfer of wealth from the richest countries to the uh, poorest countries, meaning after this plan of uh, five years, which went, will end up in 2026, there's going to be also a second plan which will structurally uh, subsidize or move money from uh, the northern to the southern. And therefore, the, the most important thing is uh, uh, to get it right, the process of spending the money. So 
maybe we can accept that something will go wrong at this uh, this round but uh, uh, european commission uh, germans uh, the netherlands and so on shall be asking uh, that uh, the, the 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 countries uh, that don't have like a good practices of spending money they 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 get common framework for example by copying best practices from germany and other places and uh, and uh, it's it's then a permanent process which will remain in place for a number of years because otherwise co european cohesion will go belly up right okay Thanks. okay paolo do, do paolo do turn off that per favore and, and be careful with the driving uh grazie um we would say i would say to the two questions uh italy versus spain you know, I have a very good friend, Lucrezia Racing, who's an economist at the Union Business School. And we're always fighting. Uh, she says Spain is worse, uh, Spain is better, and I say Italy is better. So the one that looks at their own country, always think their own country is more in trouble. So I don't know Italy too much. So I feel that they're doing better. Uh, Draghi would be a huge gain. He's not just your usual technocrat. Draghi is also a, a smart politician. He showed that in his management of the ECB. Is somebody with, with with really management skills and political skills, so I, I hope it's going to do better than that. At the moment, it wasn't okay. So the Conti the Conti efforts weren't very very promising, um, and that's why Renzi was was unhappy. Um, Matteo Renzi. Second on structural versus versus permanent. Look, structural investments that are one off versus permanent transfers. Look, every single piece of wording in this legislation says this is one off. You and I can think this could be a germ for a future fiscal um, element of fiscal union in Europe. Hopefully, why not? But that's not what the facility says, and that's not what the what the design is. The design is to fight this crisis, and look how the money re is reduced extremely quickly. Right? It's very much something that that it goes away very fast. So, um, is designed for. Use the money now to make fast, quick transformation and structural reform. Make sure that your economy is going to have higher ability to grow in the future. That is the design and not definitely not north-south permanent transfers. Um, thanks very much, Paolo, and do stay safe. Thanks, Luis. Thanks. Dino, could you, you can ask your question next. Yes, hi. Um, hi, thank you, Fiona. Um, thank you. Um, Luis, um, you're also doing something unconfessable. Uh, no, but, um, uh, my face is not pretty. Um, <laughs> no, my camera doesn't work. Um, I, I have two questions. Um, hopefully, they will be easy for you and also quick. Um, first one, I think it's safe to say that uh, corruption has been a, a big burden for Spain, has always been uh, for Spain, its economy, and most importantly, its future prospects. Why doesn't the EU take a more active role fighting corruption? Uh, there is an inherent ailment in Spain and I see year on year, nothing's being done. Uh, I don't think that will be sorted internally. Why doesn't the EU take a more uh, active stance uh, to, to, to fight that ailment that otherwise it's not gonna go anywhere? Why? Um. Uh, the the uh, the EU is 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 taking some active uh, uh, stance. Let me let me enumerate a couple of things. So in these plans, there will be at the request of the Parliament a single database of final beneficiaries. So we will be able to say who's getting the money. That's a big thing, okay? Uh, because it's very easy to see somebody is not the kid is just seeing the name and putting them in Google. Uh, that's how you found the, the training uh, scandal scheme in uh, in, uh, in Andalusia. Uh, the, the two people in Social Security Administration, one of them, as a result, was appointed by us, at my recommendation, uh, Councillor of, of Social Security and Employment in Andalusia, Rocío Blanco. They discovered that the training money was going to people uh, teaching English to people who didn't have secondary education and things like that. It was clear that they weren't teaching English. Um, so this, having the final beneficiary list is good. We're going to have the Court of Auditors and the Anti-Fraud uh, Office and also the European Fisc Attorney involved, second, uh, second important point. Um, and we are going to uh, uh, 
have what is called a rule of law mechanism that basically protects uh, the judiciary, the press, and the whole legal infrastructure that is required to ensure that we are fighting against corruption. It's easy to say Spain doesn't do anything about corruption, but I don't know if any other country would have actually prosecuted the king, the son-in-law of the king, the old prime minister, Lai Rajoy, uh, basically most ministers of the old PP government of Aznar have been uh, charged with corruption. I mean, I think that as long as the independence of the judiciary is preserved, which is obviously some people in this current government don't want to do, um, there is uh, there is hope that we can continue fighting it. But those yeah. are the three elements that I would emphasize. Yeah. I think the underground economy is getting bigger uh, every year. And it should yeah. be the other that's way what you think? Um, that, that, obviously, that's my personal opinion uh, from, from as an outsider. Um, my my I, sense, you know, I have just had construction done, etc. Everybody, I don't have to ask for the VAT. I mean, maybe because I'm not a politician. <laughs> you know, I don't ask for the VAT. This guy's going to get me in trouble. But people just do a bill with the VAT now regularly. That's my sense. But maybe, maybe I'm being optimistic. Yeah, um, and, and, and quickly, yeah, my yeah. second question: um, Would you say that uh, one of the main reasons why Spain uh, is and has always been dragging behind compared to other EU countries is the proof, uh, the poor performance of the political class and their concern to win the next elections more than anything else? Or does that uh, poor performance happens in every country? Obviously, I suppose we only know most about Spain, but I see that you know uh, political parties just they wait for the mistake of the party in power to take advantage. Uh, take my your sense is that my sense is that there is a particularly uh, poor political class in Spain. Yes, I think that that uh, voters are not demanding uh, um, education and training. I had a tweet which had 1.2, and I think, I think there is a lot of people who do. I had 1.2 million retweets on my tweet saying that, uh, 1.2 million views, I'm sorry. <laughs> if it was 1.2 million retweets, I would be hmm. an influencer. Uh, on the tweet where I basically said, well, shouldn't the health minister know a bit about health in the middle of the pandemic? People seem to agree. But there was a lot of people, interestingly, who they've actually written articles in newspapers accusing me of populismo de centro, uh, of, of center party populism, by asking for merit in government jobs. That's wrong, apparently. So there is really a big constituency in Spain for ignorance, right? Que uh, inventen ellos. Um, and, and, and the politicians are basically not seeing a big reward. I mean, if you think of Popular Party, who is the economist of Popular Party, who does their budget plans, who makes sure that their sums add up, I challenge you to tell me there is nobody in, in Congress. If you tell me in Socialist Party, the top people, George Sevilla, Miguel Sebastián are out, um, you know, most parties end up being these kind of closed bureaucracies where basically you are forced to appoint people uh, who are basically party members and who are owed favors by somebody who helped them propel people, etc. The system is pretty pathetic. You, you think it's pathetic from the outside. If you knew it from the inside, you will be beyond shocked, right? Um, so so uh, the truth is that there is very little quality in the whole political system and there is very little demand for quality in the political system. It's a very crony system. And I think that's a huge failure of the Spanish society, but it is the way it is. I, I, I think. Know, I think. I think you need to leave. Sorry, somebody. yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. We, we, need to, we need to move on, uh, otherwise we're not yeah. going to get to many of these questions. Julian, Gil, if you want to ask a question, and then after that we'll take one from the chat. Julian, if possible, try to limit yourself to 30 seconds or so, yeah. so that we can we can take more. So. Uh, no worries, Dr. Garicano. I'll be I'll be very very brief. Thank you. Um, it, uh, very specific question, uh, but kind of big picture -ish. You've got a Spanish reform project, right? That has nice. won EU funds. It goes ahead and it does its thing. It has its sort of semester or checkpoint meeting, right? And then you review the project's performance. Europe says, no good. 
this is not going anywhere. It's not meeting standards. You're not delivering, right? What happens then? Basically, is the project killed and you deal with the political, um, you know, uh, the political consequences, or is there some kind of like sunk cost? Okay, we'll somehow keep it alive, try to improve it. Because they, there's a peer performance aspect, and then there's a visibility and optics aspect, right? So, I think Julian, you've asked the, the, the billion dollar question here. Uh, Seventy. Uh, uh, it's it's really question, an open question. Let me put it like this: whether the European Commission will have the guts to stop uh, payments when things are not on track. Uh, that's why the Dutch wanted to introduce this. this this, this break where the commission's implementation decision kind of says, yeah, 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 it's all going and you see it and it doesn't happen, then member states could stop it. Now, that's the double, that's the double step that could convince you, Julian, that there could be real accountability. Um, of course, between mem member states, you know, we're on the table, you, you give me a favor today, you let me spend my money in wrong ways, I let you spend your money in wrong ways tomorrow. That's a fear that uh, one member state scratches one's back uh, to, to get its, its own back scratched. So your question, Julian, is, is very well taken and we can only see it with time. I, I can tell you only that the commission tells me that they're extremely serious about these reforms. And you know, the one thing that gives you some hope is that Europe knows its whole future is involved here. If Europe fails at this, if this is corrupt money that is badly spent, then the scandal will damage not just fiscal union, but the whole structure of Europe for decades. So this is one of the most important things we've ever going to put in place. And it's incumbent among us, I will be from parliament watching as well, to really make noise if things are not. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really only have time for a couple more questions. There, there was one on the chat. Uh, do you think banks could play a role in the distribution of the funds? So they have connections with, FM, with SMEs and consolidated process to distribute the funds? Um, not really, because these are not like loans. These are not like the direct aid for a restaurant to improve. That's what the bank knows how to do. These are projects uh, to transform. Um, these are projects to 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 uh, to digitalize the SMEs. These are pro projects to, to get training to employees. I don't think this would coincide with the skills of the bank. If we were talking about React EU, giving direct help to SMEs to get them capitalized and to avoid insolvency, then I would say, yeah, sure. But this is not what we're talking about. Okay, understood. Uh, Sebastian, do you want to ask the next question? So, uh, very briefly too, on a more macroeconomic uh, note, Luis, uh, do you see with uh, all this uh, uh, new money being printed and uh, most probably with uh, some of the projects uh, not being like uh, really profitable, do you see like the inflation menace haunting us in the short term? That's a great question, right? I mean, we are, we are all wondering like, um, People have all this cash, banks have all this liquidity, the European Central Bank has printed all this money. See it this way. The standard of living in most countries hasn't massively dropped, or in fact, it has remained more or less. And the actual size of the pie of goods being produced has massively decreased. So if we're not producing the same thing, but we have the same income, somehow those two things don't fit. And when we go out in the 1920s style, to spend all this money in partying because we're all vaccinated, there will be not enough parties for everybody. Just to put it in a very simple way, if you also are from Chicago, can think uh, can think in, in terms of Lucas Trees of Morigliani Media Pizzas or whatever you want. Um, so how are we, this, how is this going to add up without picking, picking steam on prices? The mainstream of the economics profession thinks um, inflation is unlikely because expectations are anchored around very low inflation. Inflation hasn't happened in the, expect, in the lives of most people. And uh, there is clearly a good equilibrium where inflation doesn't happen, where people are still prudent, where people are not going out to spend all this liquidity. But I think there's a bad scenario where, you know, you need a little shock to get what is called, you know, those who you do you be macro, you remember inflation expectations are anchored now. If they lose this anchor if people start to think in terms of, well, Wait a second, things are going to be more expensive right now. The money is going to 
be worth less. Let me spend it today before that happens. And then you start getting that cycle. Um, then things could change very fast. Let me tell you a secret uh, that you probably heard on your micro class. Um, price prediction models are extremely bad. Um, it's very hard to predict future prices, not just of oil, but of anything. So what people are going to tell you about inflation is not necessarily very credible. I think you have to just be cautious and have the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve ready to act. My fear, and I'm going to show you a Vox EU piece I wrote about this fear. Uh, um, my fear is that, uh, I'll put it in the chat so that people have it. Um, the, 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 mm, there it is, tackling inflation if it reappears. Uh, and now I go to the Zoom and paste it on the chat. For those of you who are interested in my views on this question, here is the answer. Um, so basically my fear here, Sebastian, is that once the banks have to actually raise rates, they won't there. And the reason they won't there is because first, that increases the cost to the states, which are up to here. And if they have to pay high interest rates on their bonds, uh, they're going to be in trouble in the reserves, etc. And second, because the financial system is hooked on cheap credit. And you know, financial assets fluctuate a lot when you're close to the zero bound with small rate changes in rates. A big change in rates, two or three points is going to send all the asset prices tumbling. The financial system will be in crisis, in crisis like in the taper tantrum and the central banks won't bear to actually raise rates. That's the argument in this uh, box EU piece that I just sent you. Interesting. Thanks, Luis. Thank you, sir. We, we're we're over time. I think Luis. I don't know if you should we take one more question. No, no. Five? I'm happy to take to take one more oral question. It's kind of interactive and people like it. Okay. Well, we've got Beatriz Malo. Please, if you can unmute. Hello, Luis. Thank you very much for the time uh, from uh, London again. My question really is about, um, do you think this uh, rescue package is the first step towards a fiscal union? And if so, do you think um, that would be a good thing and a good solution for Europe? That's a, that's a great question, Beatriz. I mean, in some sense, those of us who were kind of thinking of this early and, and, and trying to push it, we're very much hoping for that, right? That this is the germ of a fiscal union. The explicit terms of the deal say no. The explicit mm -hmm. terms of the deal say, this is one off, there's a crisis, and this crisis we're going to give, but it's a precedent. And once we have a precedent, we do it well. If Europe does mm -hmm. well, if Spain does well on spending the money and spending it well, uh, Italy does well, you know, the big players, Spain, Spain and Italy are going to drive all the narrative because the bulk of the money is Spain and Italy. Spain and Italy spend this money well, do reforms, use the money properly. Um, I, there must be another meeting that I'm missing. Uh, um, yes, I need, to, I need to take this. So um, the, the, if, if Spain and Italy end up spending money properly, and this is good, good results, my expectation is that the next time something happens, that will be a good precedent. That would be the hope. Explicitly, no. Implicitly, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're out of time for questions. Luis, if you want to have any closing remarks or, or. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. I mean, it's always beautiful to do something from Chicago. Thanks for Chicago alumni. Thanks to Fiona. Thanks to Sebastian for organizing it. There is a uh, hundred people right now online, which is wonderful. I mean, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's really a pleasure. I see a uh, thank you from, from, uh, from Bocconi, uh, in Madrid and and uh, uh, thank you thank you very much Massimo and, and all the others uh, Paolo etc. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and all the help that you can give in in promoting the message that we have to be responsible. We have to spend this money well. We have to be able to to um, uh, to do things in a in a in a proper way. Uh, and, and, and use this opportunity, not let the train pass, use this opportunity to transform Spain. Um, that will be really important message to pass. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your hospitality. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your time. Thank Luis. you very much, Luis. Hope to see you around very soon. Great to see all these faces. From Thank you very much. Uh, Absolutely.